over um, now to, I'll take questions and comments three at a time, if that's okay with everyone, and then give the speakers a chance to come back. Yeah. Lady in the blue top. I, I actually have a very specific uh, question, which led from the, um, something I heard, that in America, the fracking companies were made exempt from the Clean Water and Air Act, or whatever they're called there. And, uh, have, has that happened? Thank you. Has, has in Britain, are the energy companies exempt from any Clean Water and Air Acts in the same way they have been in the USA for fracking purposes? Thank you. And man in the blue shirt there? <coughs> I hope blue shirt doesn't identify political allegiance. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> David Wilsdorf. Now look, this is about changing government's policy on climate change. The question I ask is this. Who controls government policy on climate change? In whose benefit is the government's policy on climate change being manipulated? And what access to power do you think you've got in the Environmental Audit Committee in the light of the government's rebuttal on the Arctic safety report that you put okay. in? So the question then is, in the light of who controls government policy, what access to power do we have and how can we improve it? Thank you. Um, there's a man in a white shirt just there. Yeah. Hi, thanks. Um, so, so you mentioned the 2050 target. Um, I'm probably one of the youngest people in this room, I should think. Uh, when I, in 2050, I'll probably be in my 60s. Um, Professor Anderson, earlier on when he was talking, he, he warned us to be wary of politicians talking about large reductions in not my term of office. Um, and then went on to say that for a 63% chance of a 2 degree C target, um, we'd have to be zero carbon in 2030, not 2050. Uh, that that would mean reductions of 40% by 2015 and reductions of 70% uh, if I remember correctly by 2020. Sorry if I'm starting to sound a little desperate, but uh, I'm starting to feel as though I haven't got much of a future going on to 2050. And how Listening to you, I, I'm not quite sure <laughs> how we can get this across to change government policy. I mean, you know, I'm still none the wiser right now. Yeah, bring it back up. Okay. So, um, should we go in the same order that you spoke in? Okay, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best to respond to the three points made. But the first one was about fracking and what's happened in um, the US with energy from fracking coming onto the market. And the first thing that that means is that obviously our energy here is completely um, uncompetitive. That's how it's seen by way of comparison. And I think that the biggest thing on that is therefore, how do you actually measure whether or not there is that environmental harm and to what extent that environmental harm is actually quantified? So I don't think we're in the same situation yet that the US is in, and to my knowledge, there hasn't been any exemption. What there have been is various ministerial statements. Um, most recently, I think, from Chris Smith, in his capacity as chairman of the Environment Agency. And I think that one of the key things that we need to do in Parliament is to be able to carry on raising the issue about well, what is the damage to the environment? And how does that get factored into, if you like, the costs of outweighing the so-called cheaper benefits of investment in fracking um, as opposed to anything else? But I am concerned about it because I think from a European Union point of view as well, obviously um, they're looking at you know, the cost, the relative cost of production and, and the impact of fracking, as I'm sure you heard earlier on, is just having a huge issue. So I think that we have to watch and monitor the environmental aspects of it very carefully. And this whole agenda is not just about what's going on through the United Nations COP um, negotiations, it's about what's going on through the Rio plus 20 negotiations on the environment as well. Um, so, yes, and I think the more that people can ask of each MP around the country how that environmental appraisal has or hasn't been done and what the implications of it are, um, that's really important um, for the TUC to be actually involved in that. The second question from David about who controls um, government policy. 
I think the difficulty is it's a bit like the Nye Bevan thing, isn't it? You know, he got elected and he went to be a local councillor, a district, a county councillor. You know, where do you go to to where the power is? Actually, the power, I think, is with the corporations. And it's with the vested interests, where there is no transparency whatsoever about who they are lobbying and how it is being done. And therefore, I think this whole question about disclosure and, and how we can actually understand how this lobbying is being done is just really, really important. Who is getting to government? Who are they listening to? And that's why I think just having the, the grassroots movement coming up is just really important because there has to come a time when governments have to <coughs> listen um, to what people out there are saying rather than people who make the profits. But in respect, you especially mentioned, if I may, our Environmental Audit Sector set Committee report, Protecting the Arctic. Um, I'm quite proud of that report, actually. And I know for some people it didn't go far enough. And I know it never will go far enough. Um, but we did make recommendations that the government had to respond to. And there were very few of them that they actually accepted. But I subsequently had a meeting with Greenpeace, who told me that our report was actually making waves in all kinds of ways at the level of the Arctic Council. And I think that on this agenda, one of the things that we have to look at is, you know, we might be directing our work that we're doing at a government or at the UN talks, but actually, there's a lot going on on climate change, for example, through things like the organisation called GLOBE, which is made up of legislators from all the way around the world. And we've now got 31 countries where we have got national legislation on climate change onto the statute book. And the challenge from Christina Figueres, who was at the UN, to GLOBE last year, or maybe it was this year, was that we need to double that to 60. So I think that there is a lot going on, despite what government isn't doing. And in a way, it just keeps on raising this further up the profile. In terms of um, yourself in 2050, um, I, oh, sorry, can I just go back to the Arctic? But we will carry on following up on recommendations that the government have rejected at every opportunity. So one report on its own isn't just the end of it. We will get shelled back before us and give them that platform to be able to talk to us about it. But 2050, you know, I remember going to Basel, having done a whole load of work to get cycling tracks in my constituency. And I think we were we had like 25 metres of cycling tracks. And I went to Basel to speak at this conference on sustainable transport. And by the way, we haven't talked very much about transport, but transport is a big part of how we, if you like, make that transition to the zero carbon economy that we need. But I remember going to Basel and there was a chairman who was there who um, was very proud to have this um, conference which was celebrating the opening of a cycle network right the way across Basel in Switzerland and he stood up there this was about 20 years ago and he said well he said I thought I was doing it for my children he said but actually we've completed this cycle track in time for our grandchildren and I didn't really understand what he was talking about but after 26 years in Parliament I do about how long it takes sometimes to do anything um, in fact, I met with the people in Stoke-on-Trent and Sustrans yesterday about sustainable transport. We've now got about 100, but we've got many, many, many more lengths of cycle network as a result of action on the ground. But the point that I'm making is, is that we haven't got that luxury of learning the lesson, each of us, in our own lifetimes, about the step change that uh, Professor Stern says that we have to make on this climate change agenda. And so therefore, for yourself and for my grandson, we all have to be concerned. And so I just feel that that just means that we have to up the efforts and energy that we put into this in a concerted, informed, educated way. And we just need to concentrate, I think, on finding the solutions. And going back to my football analogy, um, you know, it's, yes, it's about the goals that you score, but it's actually about the, the, the game that is going on in the process and going with every turn 
and you know manoeuvre and actually using every single opportunity whether it's been a member of a workplace trade union whether it's a representation as, as a trustee of a pension um, fund or whatever it is influencing a local council to look and see where its sustainability development should, policy should be use every opportunity to take this agenda forward I'm sorry I've gone over time well, um, just very briefly on the uh, fracking question, I mean, the simple answer is that the fracking companies in Britain are not exempt from whatever um, regulations the Environment Agency um, is drawing up. I think the local regulations are, are being developed. The worry I've got is the capacity of the Environment Agency to police an, an industry which, if it gets going, uh, will be setting up thousands of drilling points across Britain involving you know unknown <coughs> quantities of water with maybe disclosed chemicals but still will you know how on earth can an industry such as this with its vast demands of water resources and chemicals call itself you know what it isn't trying to pretend to be a sustainable industry it, it, it developed in the US where obviously there were far weaker um, environmental controls which is why when you turned on the tap you brought gas and people were setting light to the gas coming out of their cold water tap. And, you know, maybe that won't happen in Britain, but there are, there are serious concerns about the capacity of environmental agencies in Britain to even regulate such an industry. And, of course, in any case, the TUC opposes its, its development. Um, secondly, I mean, who controls government policy? Well, I, I just think what I'd like to do is to kind of raise the sense of optimism that we can, feel we can make a difference to government policy. The small differences that we have been able to make around in some aspects of industrial policy should be a mere shadow of the kind of influence <coughs> that we should be able to secure in working with an incoming Labour government. Oh, I must say, if Joan has a voice and she's the Energy Secretary, that would be fantastic. And I think we would then begin to feel we had access and influence. And Labour's never going to be perfect for many in this room, including myself, but you know, it's, it, it would be great to have a government coming in that maybe learnt some of the mistakes it made in opposition, some of the things that Downmore should have been doing, the simple things it, it should have done around, if you heard the speaker the, from the Fire Brigade Union, about, about making, um, the, giving a statutory obligation for the fire and rescue services to do with flooding, which didn't exist and which Labour did not introduce. There are so many specific things like that which put together should really help change the nature of the relationship between trade unions and government and policy. That doesn't mean to say it's going to be perfect, but it would be a far better place to be than where we are now. And specifically on the 2030 target and the zero emissions, I mean, just keep fighting. You know, that's all we can do. I mean, on the, on the energy bill, we lost that vote by 12 in Parliament. There's every reason to believe that a really ambitious carbon target for the energy bill would make a big difference in bringing forward low carbon investments. So let's keep hoping on that. Thank you. I'm, I'm bearing in mind the time. What I'm going to do is I'm going to give it open to the floor and then come back to the speakers for about 30 seconds at the end. I've seen Daniel there. I've seen you in the pink shirt. I will, I will make a note of all of you. If you could... Daniel Shaw from Greenspeed. 2008 Environmental Audit Committee recommended a reduction of the national speed limit to 55, saying that that would bring it home to the whole public, the urgency of carbon reduction. And I was really pleased to hear Joan Wally say that their work doesn't end with a report, it continues. So 2008, to get out of the library, it was a recommendation of reducing the national speed limit to 55 miles an hour. It's an emergency demand of this campaign as well. And the lady in the pink shirt, I think, and then a gentleman down here. Hi, Andrea Davies from Evening Friends of the Earth. Um, I was wondering about your views on scrapping Trident. Uh, wouldn't scrapping Trident offer a fantastic opportunity for industrial conversion to a um, low carbon economy? Thank you. Um, there was a gentleman down here first, or do, should we just do it in order? Because I will come to all of you. And keep okay. A democracy only works if you've got an educated electorate. My problem is, I heard of Desertec and the Smart Grid something like eight years ago. 
the awareness of that project amongst the general public is slightly more than minus one. <laughs> In Germany, which is the home of Siemens, the awareness of Desertec and the smart grid is in the orders of 20-30%. Go on into uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, okay. the Green Party member uh, in the GLA. Okay. My question is, is there any intention of this government making the populace aware of the smart grid? And it is ultimately going to be the way we have to go, and the sooner you start making the public aware of it, the sooner we'll get there and better the planet in 60 Thank years' you. time. And there's a gentleman just down here. There's one topic that doesn't seem to have come up very much in this uh, conference, and that is the role of the mass media. Although the internet and other means of communication are important to sort of subspace communication, the mass media, and that includes the BBC, still have an enormous effect. And what the mass media do, they seem to have an agenda, and they're very good at it. At, they've been very successful in the past few decades in suppressing the trade union movement, marginalising it, and also at the same time bigging up the um, there is no alternative agenda. They help bring a lot of economists on who speak the same old claptrap and they all agree with one another so that there's no alternative. And uh, finally, they give an enormous amount of airtime to well-funded, organised climate change denialists. And I think this is really, the, although you might laugh at uh, Delling, Pohl and... Uh, Moncton and, uh, to a lesser extent, Lawson, I think these people have been extremely dangerous in weakening the consciousness. I, I do think it's time that some sharper action is taken against these sort of people and they, that some restrictions placed on, on, on the media and more questioning of who is actually controlling it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, there was a gentleman at the front there it's just really a supplementary to the last question. Um, what might be done about the climate change deniers, apart from pillarising them whenever possible as perpetrating crimes against humanity? Okay. Yeah. Um, there, there's someone sitting at the back. Yeah. Oh. They were waiting at the back first. Okay. I'm sorry if I can't see you, all of you all stand up and make it easier. Hello, my name is Nobu from Jan Japanese Against Nuclear, newly formed uh, Japanese group in the UK. And I'm really glad that uh, nobody uh, supports nuclear power oh, as a do. solution. Oh, oh, already? Bloody do, and quite a lot of people here yeah, too. Oh, <laughs> can you come to <laughs> um, What I want to say now is uh, nuclear power is not the answer for climate change. And uh, actually, it was the accident itself that the Japanese government decided to stop the nuclear power stations, but it is people's uprising who still keep stopping the Japanese can I ask government. How, can you relate just, this to yes, the, yes, the workshop, please? Yes, just one thing. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. After 52 nuclear power stations have been stopped, the average temperature of the Japan Sea or East Sea has been dropped. Nuclear power is emitting. Um, can use only 30% of the generated power for heating. 70% power, 70 of the heat which was generated are wasting to be just emitted to heat the air and the water. That's what I want to... Um, okay, thank you. And um, there's a gentleman over there in a pink shirt, I think, or red shirt, who's just waiting. And I'll come to the lady on the front. You haven't got very many female speakers. And then I'm afraid we're going to have to send it back to the speakers because we're running out of time. Uh, thank you, David Flint, Enfield Green Party. This morning, Kevin Anderson said that the only way in which we could meet our obligations to uh, restrain climate damage and meet, uh, meet the requirements of equity was by going for a managed long-term recession. How would the panel think we might actually get that across? 
at the level of government and in terms of the electoral consequences of adopting it. Okay. Um, there's a lady down the corner here. Hello, I'm up. my name's Cathy and I'm a Unison steward in a, in a university. Um, I'm going to ask something which I tried to ask in another workshop and didn't get a clear answer for to. Um, climate policy must include food policy. Um, worldwide, uh, um, farm animals actually produce more greenhouse emissions than transport. We really need to discourage meat eating. What is the government and your committee and the unions going to do about it? I'm afraid we're going to have to bring it back to the speakers now. Thank you. Um, if we'd like to do it, I know I appreciate it's a huge amount, so to, to kind of touch on, but if you wouldn't mind, that'd be great. Right, I'll, I'll try and speed through the questions. Um, first, with the speed limit, uh, I do remember that report, and yes, we did have that um, proposal. That was before I was the chairman of the committee, and I think you make a good case um, for us perhaps revisiting that particular um, inquiry that we did. In fact, I'd sort of forgotten about it, I shouldn't really admit to that, should I? Um, but I think it comes down to, I mean, ev every single question that we've had, I think it's all linked up to informed public debate and informed education. And I was listening to the debate on the radio yesterday when there was a report published about whether or not speed um, is dangerous or not and about the use of speed cameras. And I think that what this agenda needs is a step change in terms of behavioural attitudes as well. And that is one of the issues that I think underpins every question that we've had asked. You can't impose these kind of draconian measures because, well, maybe you can. I mean, if you look at the sort of Second World War, there was, you know, rationing. People accepted rationing and they accepted all kinds of things because of the emergency that they were in. But there's no understanding at the moment that there is any, um, the urgency with which the people who have got the scientific research there um, are saying that we need to deal with this. So I think it's how we have informed public debate on each and every one of these subjects, including speed, because speeding is down to people as well, but we will look at that. The second one was about um, scrapping tridents. Uh, my own personal view, and I say this as a member of the Labour Party, um, for many years, um, but um, four weeks ago I was at a meeting in Burslem, in my constituency, with Bruce Kent, and I was very pleased to host him attending that meeting and to work with local people in North Staffordshire about the importance of the campaign to actually um, scrap Trident. I believe that the money that it would save could be a way of actually sort of moving money over into the areas where we need to invest, I know that that's not um, universally shared by my Labour Party colleagues, um, either in the party or in the parliamentary Labour Party, but I think that there is a debate about it, and I think that the discussion that's going on about the policy of the Labour Party as we move towards the general election, there's an opportunity to move that debate. But in saying that, I'm very conscious that um, it's an issue as well in terms of trade unions, in terms of the jobs that are involved. And I think that with every one of these very difficult issues that we're looking at, we have to see things in the round. And if we're talking about scrapping something or protesting against something, we have to look at what the solution is and make sure that we get that just transition. And that needs to be a part of that debate. The next issue was about um, importance of democracy and an educated electorate. I just couldn't agree with you more. I worked very hard, something like 28 years ago, to get my city of Stoke-on-Trent twinned with Erlangen in Germany. And in fact, next weekend, I've got a, um, some local eight-year-olds and 10-year-olds going out to play in a football tournament, coming back to football again, never goes away, Port Mail doesn't, um, to Erlangen. Um, and Erlangen, as many of you will know, is the headquarters of Siemens. And, and um, as someone who was brought up in school to actually speak German and went out on different um, exchanges when I was at school um, to be able to speak German, um, I see how the political debate in Germany um, from Frankfurt onwards with the nine um, Atom and Kraft, nine Danke, 
um, has really changed people's perceptions. So that the whole attitude in Germany towards renewable energy and phasing out nuclear power is completely different. So I just think that it's really important that we have informed public discussion about all of these things at one and the same time. Which comes on, I think, straight to the mass media question. And I'm as frustrated as anybody. Uh, in fact, I wrote to Chris Patton when he was appointed chairman of the BBC about the coverage and engagement with sustainable development issues. And again, you know, the celebrity culture that we have in the media and the lack of engagement and the growing disengagement with politics at a local level, um, I think is scary. And the sort of understanding that it's all about celebrity culture and not about the really important things that matter. So what do we do to engage with people and I think that's where trade unionists at the workplace, with their fellow colleagues, with their families, with their neighbours, are ideally placed to really, if it's not been done in the media, to actually get this you know, discussion going. And I think that links in very much as well with local radio. I think there's a real fear of local radio being dumbed down. Um, I know I listen to some local radio and I can't quite believe what I'm hearing. Um, and I think the more that we can do through phone-ins and everything else to actually raise the agenda on this, the better. Um, I have to put my hand up, I'm not very good with social media, um, but social media I think has got a role in all of that. Uh, and there was another issue about nuclear power, which I think I've sort of dealt with really. And um, the Green Party question about the, the issue about the um, recession. Look. We need to change everybody's behaviour in a completely different way, and that's not going to come about overnight. So I just think that we have to start to look at GDP in a different way and start to measure economic success by things other than playing profit and loss accounts and actually look at ways in which we value the things that matter to me. And that is going to be a long-term process. Um, but hopefully the further down the journey that we can get, the more will become possible. And on food, and let me just say, I, I'm not a, nothing to do with the Conservative Party, um, I'm not part of the front bench of the Labour Party either, but in my independent role, if you like, chairing the Environmental Audit Select Committee, we did an inquiry on food. I tried to introduce a private member's bill on having um, food procured in the public sector to have certain nutritional um, aspects to it, which was thrown out by this government. And if you look at our green food inquiry, or our food inquiry in the Environmental Audit Select Committee, I would hope that somehow some of the aspects of this whole policy that we've looked at, transport, um, climate change, um, investment, finance, the green economy, food, that there is a basis there. And I think what we have to do, and what I have to do, and up my game on, is doing what I can, along with everybody else here, to actually influence Labour Party policy on that and all the other issues to the next election. Um, <laughs> Joan should really have finished off, actually. I should have gone before her, because, you know, I mean, the work she's done in Parliament has been great. I, I can't possibly pick up all the points raised just now because we're running out of time, but... Just for one, on the point of a managed long-term recession, well, we've got, a man we've got a recession, it's just a completely unmanaged one. I, I think this is difficult territory for all of us in this room, if we're candid, that obviously we need to deal with the problem that there are one million young people that are out of work. And, you know, we need to invest to grow, to provide work for those young people. I just don't understand how we can do that and have a managed recession. Well, what I do appreciate is the point that it's, what, it's where we invest and how we invest that really matters. And investing in our high consumption behaviours is really not the way to go. Just one point on that, that we have an import carbon footprint which is bigger than our domestic. In other words, we import wind turbines and, electric and vehicles and smartphones and all these other products that we consume from abroad. I think if we were to make more of this stuff in Britain, we would reduce transport emissions and secondly we would be able to then ensure that we manufactured sustainably rather than imported unsustainable products. That would be my thought on, if you like, the question about recession. On nuclear, the TUC, we, have, we, are, an, we are a trade union movement with, with members in aviation, in nuclear power generation, in the Trident industry. 
yes, Jonas made the point, if we're going to transition, we have to find ways, we have to find alternatives for all of those workers in all of those well unionised and well paid industries, and to which there is no simple answer. On the question of the those those really aggravating climate change denialists and the Daily Mail headlines, if you remember the one in late November when after a gale in Scotland, one wind turbine caught fire because the brakes failed, and the headline in the Daily Mail was at, with this picture of this burning wind turbine, new questions must be asked about wind turbines. And you thought, no they don't, on the same pitch there was a dog, you know, kind of struggling against the gale, and you thought, new questions should be asked about dogs <laughs> going out in the wind. I mean, it just made no sense. And it's a headline, and it undermines that point about renewable energy, which is so important to our future. And just finally on, um, on the question of food policy, um, the TUC hasn't developed a, a, a policy on this area, but it's, it's an open book, and use your trade unions to promote that and any other policies that you think we need to be pushing. Thank you very much. Thank you both. And I'm, I'm sorry about running over on top. I tried to keep it with sneakily within an hour, actually under an hour, because we've run over from the last session, but in the end, I don't think we quite managed it. Um, but, but thank you for everyone's patience and everything. But I, I'd quite like to draw the, the kind of the things that I found that were most tangible out of what we can do to influence policy quickly. And it was input into select committees. And the other thing was taking power away from corporations before we can really influence government. And I think, I think that probably is quite key. And also um, something that Joan said, um, we need to use every opportunity to engage with MPs and government. I'm sure we already do that anyway. I, I suppose that's a kind of a, a, an important thing to remind ourselves. But anyway, um, I guess this is a conversation that we need to keep having and pushing right up at the top of the agenda about how we can actually do this. I'm sure we all ask these questions anyway. But thank you very much for your patience and, and for your contributions and to our lovely speakers as well. Thank you. I've liked it so far, I, I was supposed to go down. Uh, did you go in the trade union once? Um, which trade union? <laughs> Just now, the, 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 the session. Yeah, there were two, there were two trade unions. Trade union yeah, I was I supposed to, to be the 